And I would, as I was saying, what I'm going to talk about a little bit today is the the really paradigm shift that occurred in the 60s and 70s, uh, 1960s and 1970s related to uh, complex cerebral aneurysms. And really talk about two things that I had some interaction with, which were related to the Drake sonnet fenestrated clip and the Drake tourniquet. So as far as Dr. Drake is concerned, he, he at his time period was the most famous neurosurgeon in the world. And individuals came from all over the world um, to um, be involved in him being able to take care of them, especially with giant uh, and very complex cerebral aneurysms. He worked at the University of Western Ontario in London, Ontario, and had um, spent his whole life there. I started uh, medicine at the University of Western Ontario in 1967 and um, medicine in 1969. And so through some of that time period, I was, um, I was involved in uh, some of the uh, activities that were occurring related to uh, this area of uh, complex aneurysm surgery. So this is a picture of myself and Dr. Drake um, operating. And as I had mentioned before, this particular time period was a time period um, which was substantially different than now. At that time period, there were no CT scanning. Uh, we had brain scanning. We had uh, direct puncture and geography. And uh, Dr. Alcock, who I'll talk about in a little while, had, had developed a technique for directly puncturing the vertebral arteries in the neck, which was able to give us uh, information particularly about the posterior fossa and the posterior fossa vascularization, in other words, the blood vessels that were going to the posterior fossa. So I'm just gonna give you a, a little video related to Dr. Drake talking about one of these um, uh, posterior fossa aneurysms. Eight year old woman who had a non coma producing hemorrhage from this aneurysm about three months ago. She was late in arriving on the unit because she's from another country. One can't really tell too much about the sac from this AP view, except that it lies in the region of the, of the, of the uh, union of the vertebral arteries uh, to form the basilar artery. Lateral view, uh, one can see that the aneurysm arises uh, in this region at about the junction of the, of the middle and lower thirds of the clivus and projects directly back into the brainstem. Uh, this is the basal view, uh, which was most interesting. And actually, we didn't interpret it correctly uh, until uh, operation. Uh, it was thought to be an aneurysm of the, uh, of the left vertebral artery, since it filled best from the left injection. Uh, and this was thought to be a, just a, the two vertebral arteries coming very close together. This, of course, is reflux down the other vertebral. But as it turned out, this was an aneurysm arising at the crotch, uh, the proximal crotch here of a fenestration or a bifid basilar artery. Okay. okay. So basically what Dr. Drake was talking about there was what looked like a, um, a complex aneurysm. And so really the, the goals of my presentation are to outline some of the problems related to posterior circulation intracranial aneurysms. Really something about the team that Dr. Drake um, put together to focus on their operative treatment. Some innovative solutions related to the Drake clip and the Drake tourniquet. And really some evolution of these concepts into modern treatment of cerebral aneurysms. So as you may or not be aware, aneurysms are small blisters that occur on blood vessels, predominantly in the blood vessels of the brain, but they can occur in any, any organ. And they usually occur at the bifurcation of blood vessels related to the uh, dynamic flow of blood flowing through these blood vessels and the forces that these dynamic uh, forces are placed on the crotch of the aneurysm area here. And this can develop this blister or now, the diagnosis of cerebral aneurysms is really the same pretty well as it was at any time. It's diagnosed by really severe headache, and it can be diagnosed 
by doing a lumbar puncture and, and seeing blood in the CSF, or by doing a CT or MR scan and seeing clear evidence of blood uh, around the brain. And now we have the capacity to put, uh, to do CT and geography, which will give us more information. And if you look at where the aneurysms occur in the blood vessels of the brain, about 40% occur in the anterior communicating artery area. You have some that occur in the middle cerebral artery area, about 30, 30 to 40%. There are some that occur in the bifurcation and a very small percentage of about 4% occur at the bifurcation of the baser artery. The interesting things about these aneurysms is they can become extremely large and then compress the, the brainstem and cause all kinds of other problems. Now, cerebral, angiogra cerebral angiography was a significant benefit because as you can see here, this is an arch angiogram. And what you can see here is the blood, uh, the blood vessels of the arch are shown. You can see that the carotid arteries are shown in the background. You can also see that the vertebral arteries are shown in the bifurcation here of the basal artery. And then, as I mentioned at that time, this particular technique had not been developed. Uh, it was developed in the early 70s. So the way you would do an, angiogra an angiogram would be you would put a needle directly into the carotid artery or directly into the vertebral artery and then do the injection of the of material at that time. So this is basically what an aneurysm looks like. It's sort of a blister on the blood vessel. They're almost always in the bifurcation, the blood vessels. And this is a basal artery aneurysm. You can see the blister here, the aneurysm here. These are the, the posterior cerebral vessels and the spurious cerebellar vessels. Okay. This is sort of what it looks like when you start putting it all together from that aspect of it. And you can see that this is a, this is a, a complex situation depending on how the vessels themselves come away, or if the vessels themselves go brought up into the aneurysm. So at that particular time period, the, the typical clip that was used, as you can see here, this is a Mayfield clip. And this clip, the idea was that you would put a clip on the neck of the aneurysm. And then by putting a clip on the neck of the aneurysm, you would protect that particular patient from uh, subsequent rupture of that particular aneurysm. And related to Dr. Drake, uh, he was born in, in uh, 1920 in Windsor, Ontario. He graduated from, from um, Western um, Medical School in 1944. He was trained in Toronto and was trained by Dr. McKenzie, who was a pupil of Dr. Harvey Cushing. So there's a direct relationship between uh, Dr. Harvey Cushing, Dr. McKenzie, and other individuals who were trained by Dr. Drake. It's a continuous sort of relationship. There are two major groups of neurosurgical training programs. One had developed through Dr. Penfield at um, in Montreal. Another group had developed directly through Dr. Cushing and the whole group of, of individuals associated with that. Dr. Drake uh, practiced in London, Ontario from 1952 to 72, about 20 years. And he practiced at the university hospital there for about 16 years. And so much of the work, or at least the initial part of the work I'm going to talk to you about today, was done at what's called Victoria Hospital, which has been torn down and no longer exists, but, uh, but that was the, the site. So this is Victoria Hospital, where, where Dr. Drake initially practiced, and I, um, and I basically um, practiced until uh, I uh, came to, uh, to Montreal in, um, in 2000. So my whole career, and, or much of my career was involved with practicing here and at the Children's Hospital and also at the University Hospital, which you, which you can see here related to that. So there's really two particular hospitals that were associated with, with the developments and I'm gonna to talk to you about. So the interesting thing about um, this group was that Dr. Alcock was the radiologist and he was the individual who actually just described what's Carol called cerebral basal spasm. And the second thing about him is he was just an amazing, amazing radiologist. And uh, to give you an idea how amazing he was, he would go to the rounds, uh, the normal radiology rounds, which would involve uh, radiology rounds from um, 
on all kinds of different venom disease processes. And when I was a student, I was at one of these rounds and they were discussing an abdominal case. <clears throat> it happened to be an abdominal case associated with it. It is called endometriosis. Now, uh, there's a lot of discussion about that particular case. And Dr. Alcock just got up and said, well, this is this, this, is this particular problem. And that indeed was what it was. And um, he, uh, he was exceptionally important for doing all the angiography that we're going to see here. Um, the second individual that was important in the team was an individual by the name of Dr. Ron Eakin, who was an anesthesiologist. Again, a very interesting individual. He, uh, during the operations at that time, he, Dr. Drake would just ask him to decrease the blood pressure. Dr. Drake, uh, uh, he can decrease the blood pressure to very low levels. And in fact, I, a number of times when I was in the OR with him, he would just stop the heart and start it up with her. So um, quite, a, quite an interesting group of three men that were associated with the team at that time. Now, Dr. Drake's first paper now you got to remember, Dr. Drake came to another left Toronto and came to a smaller, a smaller place called London, Ontario, in 1952. And um, at that particular time period, he was working all by himself. There were no other neurosurgeons there. And um, when this particular paper came out uh, in 1961, he was the only neurosurgeon at London, Ontario, and had described really four cases of basal artery aneurysms at that time, which he had been involved in. And uh, dealing with. And um, he had uh, operated on these individuals and had organized a particular way of doing so, which is really called what's called the subtemporal approach. The idea being that you would have a patient in this position, you would make a small incision here, and um, maybe I can make that bigger for you. We'll see how that works. So you make a small incision here, you would do uh, an opening, small opening, and then you would be able to lift up the temporal lobe and get at the area where this, where the uh, base or artery happened to be. In Dr. Drake's time period, he clipped around 1,700 baser aneurysms. No one ever, ever, ever will clip that number of aneurysms again for a number of reasons. And one being that they treat them differently now. You can see here that there's 1,767 aneurysms. So he had the largest experience with Gostrophos aneurysms in the world and to this day still has had the largest experience. The trouble with these aneurysms really were that they looked a bit like this. You can see the aneurysm here. You can see the third nerve coercing. This is the uh, superior cerebellar artery and the posterior cerebral artery. And the problem was that many times the posterior cerebral artery was part of the actual wall of the aneurysm. So you had to find a way of clipping across here. In other words, clipping across this area here. But also you had this, this vessel in your way. So it was hard to sort of do this clipping and you couldn't see what was going on on the other side. So. But basically it happened in, in 1969, an individual who was a 46 year old production engineer in Hawaii uh, had a subarachnoid hemorrhage from a giant base rainers and very large aneurysm involved in this area. And he was transferred to an individual called Dr. Poole who happened to be in um, New York City. Uh, Dr. Poole sent most of his large um, base aneurysms up to Dr. Drake to be operated on. And so uh, Dr. Drake uh, reviewed the, uh, the angiograms that were sent. And he basically said, the more I looked at the aneurysm, the more I thought the clip might be placed across the base of the sac, sac above the origin of the two posterior cerebral arteries. This would leave a small amount of fusiform enlargement of the basal bifurcation, but it was, but it would be there. And so, so, this is a typical situation that you dealt with. You had a situation where you had a, a clip like this that was straight across. It had sort of a way of opening it. So you would squeeze the clip here. This would open up the sort of teeth of the clip. And then you would be able to put this across the blood vessel. So Dr. Dr. Drake, uh, when I was talking about this particular um, development of the, the, uh, the um, Drake clip, 
he mentioned to me and he wrote down from in brooding over the problem I knew that I was being faced. It came to me that playing with the clip, so he was playing with this particular clip, that <clears throat> the P1 that you had, the P1s in your way when you're clipping these aneurysm, usually what happened is you would dissect this, this vessel away from the, from the um, aneurysm with the hope that you could clip it. But many times when you're dissecting this, this vessel away, the aneurysm might rupture it. So um, clearly it would, there was an advantage if you didn't have to do that, uh, that um, uh, particular dissection. And so the idea came to him that he would be able to sort of place that particular uh, vessel in a aperture within the clip. So this is what it basically looks like. So this was this would be the normal clip, and this is the aperture. So you'd have the clip. You could run a, a vessel that would run right through this area, and you can still clip an aneurysm on the other side. So this is basically what, what the Drake clip um, uh, involved. So. What he basically did, and this is part of the interest related to uh, innovation, uh, he obviously couldn't develop a clip like this, but he was very friendly with Dr. Mayfield, who had developed the, the initial clip that you see. You've seen some of these pictures, and so he phoned Dr. Um, uh, Dr. Mayfield, uh, who happened to be in Cincinnati. He basically outlined the problem to him, and basically asked here, um, who was Dr. Keats, actually develop a clip, have an aperture placed in the center of it. And so uh, they, they talked about the size that would be needed to clip the aneurysm. They talked about the, how big the hole should be. And rather remarkably, within a week, three of these clips arrived from, uh, from Dr. Mayfield and Dr. Keyes. So in one week, they had, they had uh, modified the clip and uh, dealt with that particular aspect of, of the situation. So this is what the Mayfield clips look like. Um, this was a normal clip. And you can see here, this is the aperture clip that has the actual hole in it. So when I wrote, um, um, when I wrote one of Dr. Uh, Drake's uh, junior residents at the time, uh, he, he basically said, uh, and he wrote to me, he said that, I do recall the Dr. Drake delivering uh, deliver about the angiogram and uh, that Dr. Poole had sent it from New York and discussing it with Dr. Alcock. So you can see how the whole group worked together. Um, I'm sure you will recall Dr. Drake's habit of uh, removing it about clinical problems. In other words, Dr. Drake would wander around thinking about things for a period of time. Uh, he also smoked a uh, pipe, which people did at that time. And um, he basically felt that he probably could offer Dr. Mitchell some protection from the bleeding if he could actually put this particular clip onto the um, onto the aneurysm. So this is this, these are Dr. Drake's original notes. And so when Dr. Drake would do um, aneurysm surgery, he'd make notes like this. Now imagine there is 1,740 or whatever it is. Uh, direct notes related to each aneurysm that he was involved in uh, clipping. You can see these are these are the notes from that particular case. Um, the individual's name was, Dr. Uh, was uh, Mitchell. I'd actually asked the family if I could use uh, the name and they agreed. So you can see here, that this was the aneurysm. This was the actual P1 that was in the way. When you, if you went in here, the first thing you would come across would be this vessel. This is from the side. This is from the front. So you would be going at it from the side and you would see this vessel right in your way. So the question is how, how would you deal with that particular uh, situation? So basically what happened in this situation was he, he, um, he then uh, would use deep hypotension. So in the situation, you see that Dr. Drake mentions that he did 40 minutes of, of uh, uh, 10 minutes of hypotension or 40 millimeters of mercury and 20 minutes at 50. And this was really done so he could dissect the aneurysm with a decreased risk of the bleeding. And again, that was more common. That was a little bit more common at that time than it probably does now. And you can see here, this is his actual drawing of the, of the operation. So here's the clip that you actually would, would have to open. 
This is the hole, which is the bifurcation. And this is the, the two blades of the clip across the aneurysm. And this is the right posterior cerebellar artery coming through here. And this is the other artery on the other side. So this is sort of the, uh, the situation that he was involved with at that time. Now, this is the actual um, information from that. So you can again see the, the clip, the vessel, and the actual blades coming across. Um, Professor De Maestro. Right. Hey, sorry to interrupt you. I just had a quick question. I was wondering um, when aneurysms are clipped, do they ever have to be replaced over time? And what kind of complications are associated with uh, this clipping? Well, <clears throat> two things. One, if you can clip the aneurysm uh, well with uh, no particular problem, uh, there are literally thousands and thousands of people that are wandering around every day that have had clips placed on their aneurysms in, um, in their brain. Uh, the, initial, the initial clips were made of steel. Uh, and uh, with steel, the problem became with the MR scan because the MR scans could actually shift the actual clip. And uh, now all the clips are made of titanium so that they're not, not bothered by the MR scanning, but in the initial time period they were. And so, uh, so that's for the first part. Second, at that, at that particular time period also, um, there was a lot of discussion as to when to actually uh, clip the aneurysm. And the reason for that was that many of these patients, after uh, they bleed and uh, after there's blood around the blood vessels, some of the blood vessels go into spasm. And, that's, and that can result in real severe problems related to, that, uh, to uh, the patient's sort of function not because of the aneurysm itself, but because of blood being around the brain and causing uh, cerebral vasospasm from that aspect of it. So um, that is one of the other problems that still is present today related to uh, the, the issue of subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, again, um, it's, you'll, you'll see how this goes on, um, that uh, this particular operation, the, sub, the subtemporal approach, uh, was well, it was extremely common at that time period. We believe it now would operate on three baser bifurcation aneurysms a day. Three a day. And most people would not operate on one in a year. And they were patients coming in from all over the world. We had private jets coming in every day from all over the world with patients that had baser um, aneurysms. And some of the baser engines had got so large that the patients couldn't breathe anymore and they were on, they were on ventilators when they left. So this was a time period where we were trying to, we were all trying to develop ways of trying to deal with these very, very complex vascular problems. And um, um, the concept of, of saving these individuals' lives was, was, critical, was our, the most critical thing that we were involved with at that particular time. Does that help you a little bit from that? Anybody can ask any questions they want, by the way. Don't, yes, don't thank you so much. Thank you so much. So you can see here, for example, that uh, this is what the aneurysm looked like uh, before uh, clipping. And this was what the aneurysm looked like after. And what you can see here is the blood vessel here is actually going through the aperture, which is here, down here. And you can see it going up. The aneurysm is partially still filling. And sometimes they did that for a period of time. The clip may have not been able to close completely, or sometimes a little bit of the, the, the aneurysm was further farther away and the clip wasn't long enough to conclude it. But what happened in many of these cases were even when the, when the pressure was taken off, because as the blood came up, it would no longer be striking into the aneurysm. Many, many of these aneurysm just thrombos, and that was, that was it. They never were a problem with that treatment time period. So this is what basically happened with this particular individual. So the other thing I wanted to, to mention is this is Dr. Drake's notes. So they don't only involve the operation, but they involve after the operation. And this, this is an interesting part of it. Uh, he basically says at the end here, uh, Christmas card 1971, this individual was operated in 1969. Um, he says he, they got a card. Uh, his eye operation, it was very successful. This individual had a third nerve palsy afterwards and it was, it was repaired with, a, with an eye operation. And you can see here in the corner here, he says, 
I saw him <clears throat> had dinner at his home in uh, Honolulu in the spring of 1972. Um, very well, good. Everything was good with his eye. So again, you can see not only the fact that, that he had done the operation, but he'd followed up on the, on the patient, he was interested in the patient. And uh, when I interacted with the family um, related to this particular uh, individual, he was still alive when I was interacting with him as a family, the family were nothing but grateful for the care that Dr. Drake had, uh, had given them, them from that aspect of it. So it's sort of interesting to see the, um, the whole thing develop over a period of time related to, uh, to a case like this. So let's see, this, still, this will just show you how, how the fenestrated clip works. Here's the hole. Here's the blood vessel actually coursing through the hole. And you can see this is a different type of fenestrated clip, but you can see how the aneurysm's on this side here. And you can see how the clip is gonna go down. The aneurysm's right there. And it's gonna be able to clip the aneurysm and allow this particular blood vessel to lay right within the aperture of the clip. So that was a that was basically what the Drake clip was. And the second thing I just wanted to show you, that, and this is interesting for the individuals like uh, Ahmed and Mohammed, you know, this is Dr. Drake by himself operating by himself in a, in a small um, um, place in uh, London, Ontario. And these are the other types of operations he's doing. This is from the book that he kept. And I, I have all his books because he gave them to me. But here is August and September. But you can see here, here's, he's, replayed, he's uh, removing a, a subdural hygroma. He's doing a discectomy. He's doing pearls for a subdural. He's doing laminectomy here. And he's removing a shunt. He's removing a recurrent epidoma. Uh, epidoma. Uh, epidoma. Uh, he's uh, dealing with a brain tumor, subtle resection, and this is actually the, the, the aneurysm case here. So you can see that in a normal sort of time period of a number of days, he's doing multiple different operations. Um, and uh, this happened to be uh, this particular case here. And so Dr. Drake had, had books, and in these books, he, he actually outlined all the, all the operations that, that he was doing each individual day. Now, Here's, here's what you can do with these, these clips. So here, for example, is a type of aneurysm that is coming off the bifurcation here. So you can leave a blood vessel in it here and put the clip across here. Um, this is another type of situation where you had an actually very, very long, very long base here. It's not a small base like this. It's very, very long. So you could either try to put it, a blood, uh, put it across here like so. Or another way of doing it, you can use multiple clips, which involves you take a clip here, leave the butt, leave this part in, and really reconstruct that particular blood vessel. And sometimes this, this would be used especially for very large aneurysms from that aspect of it. And I remember I um, these are uncommon um, uh, uh, aneurysms in children, but I remember having a five-year-old boy which which appeared which came up with an aneurysm that was uh, almost as big as your fist. And there was no way to, to clip it in any way, shape, or form. However, using a series of these clips, uh, you could reconstruct the whole blood vessel and, uh, and deal with the aneurysm. And rather interestingly, I operated on that, that child when he was about five. Uh, he came to see me a couple of years ago, and he's, um, he's uh, finishing university now. And he has multiple clips inside of his head. <laughs> and if you looked at a CT scan, uh, you would be amazed at how many how many clips are there across that that uh, aneurysms to uh, to deal with. But again, you can see all the multiple ways of that that clip could be used to, to deal with more more complex types of aneurysms. Um, this at the top here is really the, the classical way. You know, the posterior uh, cerebral P1 coming through. It comes through the aperture and then across like so. So. <clears throat> Um, in, in 1989, uh, move forward a little bit forward. Um, in 1987, the latter part of 1987, Dr. Drake became ill. And um, I was interested now, I, um, I was a neurosurgical resident at um, 
at, at, at Western. Uh, and then I went in for six years and I went into um, a practice there in um, 1981. So I was there for uh, about 17 years when Dr. Drake was, uh, was involved in uh, care. Uh, when Dr. Drake got sick, I felt it was reasonable that I consider writing up something about the um, bifurcation uh, types of injuries, and especially the idea of the clip that Dr. Drake had, um, had um, developed. And so what I would do is I would meet with him on a regular basis, usually on a Friday morning, and he would go over his thinking and, and write notes to me. Uh, Dr. Drake had to have radiation therapy uh, in the early part of 1998. Uh, and uh, he was he was away for a period of time, and so uh, I knew he was in um, in Florida vacationing uh, with his wife Ruth. And uh, when he came back, what I would do is I would leave letters with the secretary, and um, I would ask some specific questions. And these are some of the questions that I asked. For example. Um, in your letters of correspondence being Dr. Mayfield related to the development of CLIP, was there any real correspondence? In other words, being interested in the history, I wanted to see if there were actually letters available that you could actually read and, and work on. And he basically said, no, that all his, all his contacts with Dr. Mayfield have been over the phone. Um, the second question I asked him was, uh, when was the first paper uh, in which this CLIP was discussed rather remarkably despite the fact that this operation and the clip was developed in 1969. The first time that this, this was actually put into a paper was 1978, nine years later. Now, everybody knew about this clip because Dr. Drake was, was giving papers about it, but the first time he actually put it into a paper was, was actually nine years later, which is sort of a remarkable sort of situation from that point of view. He was a very busy man and that may be part of it. The second thing that I'll discuss further, when I was a senior resident, uh, Dr. Sabuda, who was a neurosurgeon from Japan. There was, there was always neurosurgeons uh, uh, there at that particular time period from all over the world. He had arrived and I, was, and I was a senior resident at that time. And so I was opening all the cases and being involved with all the cases that were being done at the time. And so um, what I noted was that Dr. Sugita was taking incredibly you know, complex notes on every single case about the clip what, how the clip was being used by Dr. Drake and all the aspect of it. So I really wanted to ask, I just asked the question of how, how Dr. Sagita, um, what were the discussions between him and Dr. Sagita relate to the clip itself? And then he, he's quite interesting in some ways, Dr. Drake, um, were there any other issues that you feel would, uh, would be important related to the history of the development of the Drake clip? He was very, he didn't have a lot to say many times. None come to mind was it was his answer from that point of view. So again, you can see that what type of an individual he was uh, from that aspect, and so that that resulted in the paper that was published in in June of 2000 related to uh, the Drake clip from that aspect of it. Now, uh, just bringing this up again, you note here that Dr. Drake actually makes an error here. Instead of uh, instead of uh, 78, he writes 98 here which is sort of interesting from that point of view. Uh, now, the second thing that, that's involved is you look at the bottom part of the, of the note, this relates really to Dr. Sagita. Now, what, um, what Dr. Drake says here is, yes, I used a clip for him, assisted Dr. Sagita when he visited uh, here, showing him all the problems with it. Problems with the handle is too wide, problems with the blades uh, and the need to, uh, develop different blades, different angles, different lengths, et cetera. What was fascinating here, as a senior resident, one of my jobs was that Dr. Drake would, would look at the, um, the base, uh, the aneurysm when he was operating on, and he would make a decision that this blade had to be, let's say uh, 1.2 centimeters or 0 0.9 centimeters long, because if he went too far, he would clip the posterior cerebral artery on the other side. So he would say to me, I want this blood, I want this particular clip to be 1.3 centimeters. What I would do then is cut the clip, but actually cut the clip. And when I would cut the clip, I would then use a stone to really make the edges completely fine so that it wouldn't tear anything. So I would be sitting there first cutting the clip 
and using this particular stone to really smoothen off the cliffs so that they could be used. So that was what we were doing on a regular basis related to that at that particular time period. But anyway, um, basically, Dr. Rake had, had um, tried to persuade, us, persuade uh, 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 Mr. Keyes, who was the engineer, to modify it and, and to really produce, do into mass production of the clip and um, multiple different types, and I'll show you that. And what he comments here is that he had to, been told that this would cost about $200,000. So Dr. Sagita, when he went back to Japan, uh, he actually founded a company. And in that company, he began to work on uh, a number of wonderful modifications of the Drake clip. And it really turned out to be a bestseller from that point of view. So you can see here that although Dr. Drake had developed the clip and tried to get it developed in Canada, uh, it was not able to do so uh, for financial sort of reasons. It's sort of an interesting thing about innovation related to that. And also, if you can see the note that I that I write him, uh, uh, this is what I wrote to the teacher, uh, teacher Dr. Drake. You have all always been an inspiration to us, Dr. Drake, and you will continue to do, uh, to do so. It has been my honor to be one of your students and an honor to be on staff with you, and it's certainly an honor to be involved in this abstract. So basically, at that time, I was actually doing an abstract for one of the meetings. Um, Pam and I uh, send all of us to uh, Ruth and yourself from that point of view. So if you if you look at the situation here, uh, this was the this was the, the applica applicator that was used for the uh, initial Drake clip, and these were the sizes of the Drake clips. And you can see there were, there were a number of different sizes, but they weren't always the right size, and this is where they had to be um, cut. This was Dr. Sabita's applica applicator, which was much better. The clips became much much smaller, and um, many more different angles were developed, and Dr. Savita's clips are in every operator room and they're used every day all around the world from that point of view. But it really is a, a evolution from uh, Dr. Drake's um, modification of the uh, Mayfield Keys clip to Dr. Savita's clip there from that aspect. Of. Now, however, there were still problems. So in some giant aneurysms, the vessels themselves actually were pulled up into the aneurysm. You can see it here. So it was impossible to get across from here to here because the distance was too long. And also you would leave a substantial amount of the aneurysm here if you try to clip across there. It's just too much of distance to go across. So these types of, of aneurysms are also appearing on a regular basis. So one of the problems we had at the time period was when I was a resident is how, what we would do with these. So what would happen is we would operate on them Dr. Drake would attempt to see whether he could get a clip across this base or not. And if he couldn't, we just would close up and that was it. We just couldn't, couldn't deal with it. Now, all kinds of things were tried. We tried to inject, for example, uh, believe it or not, um, hair into the aneurysm. We tried to inject uh, material into the aneurysm to see if, they would, um, if that would result in its uh, thrombosis. But that sometimes resulted in the thrombosis of all the aneurysm, which would end up thrombosing blood vessels and causing real significant problems. So this particular situation, although the aneurysm uh, problem had been partially solved by the Drake clip, it did not solve the problem of the giant aneurysms. You can see, and so one of the things that were considered at that time was sometimes an attempt was made to clip the aneurysm uh, and see whether, and clip the basal artery here and see if this would decrease the flow within the aneurysm. And the hope was that the blood flow would go across here and deal with the upper part, but that again was, was fraught with danger. And so Dr. Drake started operating on these patients, for example, awake to see if he could if he could do this, and that wasn't very successful from that aspect of it, this clipping of the base or artery itself. You can see that this happens to be, I think, one of these attempts to put a clip on the base or artery. So I'm a, I am now a senior resident at um, uh, the University Hospital in, in London, Ontario. And uh, I'm involved with um, opening these cases along with Dr. Cassell and myself. Another case came in, which had a giant aneurysm. Now, what basically happened, I was in the operating room at the time. So it's, it's interesting to think back at what happened that day. So what basically happened, Dr. Drake, uh, we opened, Dr. Drake examined the, the aneurysm and basically said it could not be closed. 
So in the, uh, in the, uh, in the OR, everybody was ruminating about, you know, are there any other ways that we can deal with this problem? Um, because just clipping the aneurysm uh, when the patient was, was um, under anesthesia was not really a, uh, a real option. Operating under local uh, was, was reasonable, but it again was a problem. And so what basically happened is the concept came across with, could we uh, intermittently occlude the base artery to see whether or not the patient would be unwell? And if the patient was unwell, we would open it up again. If the patient was not, then we could um, uh, close it. So the idea came across during these discussions that we could develop a system where we could close and open the base artery as we wish when the patient was awake. And so, I had just come off uh, a while back. I had been on the uh, general surgery service. In the general surgery service, we use subclavian uh, sort of catheterization, uh, basically to feed patients at that time. And what I did a lot of my time was spent sort of re-putting in these blood vessels, these these catheters all the time because they would they would clog. But the, the it, when we were discussing this. I sort of came up with the idea, well, could we, could we develop a tourniquet using this equipment that we use for sub uh, sort of uh, clavering catheterization? And so um, Dr. Drake said, well, all right, then, then do it. So what I basically did then is I, um, miss, I used to keep notes. These are my notes from that particular uh, uh, case. And um, maybe I'll go back here. So basically, this is what I came up with. There was a polyethylene tube that we had used. So there's a tube here, and we would put the catheter through this particular tube and put it into the subclavian, and then we'd take this tube out. So then what, we initially, what I initially did is I, I put a, a silk suture into it, and then the idea was that what we could do is put the silk suture so put the cath put this tube well first take the silk put it around the base of artery where you thought you could put it around it then put this pull this through and then put a little clip here so you knew where it was but don't close the, the base of artery at that time of the operation and then pull this right out of the head and then do it later on so what this involved was this did not work very well because of the problem with the silk was that we worried that the silk possibly could, could tear the blood vessel. So again, because I've been working with the idea of these poly polyethylene um, uh, uh, tubes, we then uh, removed the silk and I came up with a polyethylene tube that we could put around the blood vessel. So, This is what it looked like. You can see here that it, um, this is the tube. This is the smaller tube that went inside. This was a small clip that was placed on it so you knew where it was. And then the base artery would be sitting in here. Then this, this tube with these two lines would then be put through the scalp here. The patient would be woken up. And while the patient was awake, this particular, and you had angio, and having an angiogram, you would then slowly pull on these two lines, which would close the tourniquet and close the blood vessel. Now, you can see how this was happening at this particular time period here. Now that was very successful in that particular patient. And within days, multiple new patients were brought into hospital that had not been able to be operated on before. And in these particular patients, um, uh, were operated on uh, continuously during the, the next number of weeks with some very successful uh, situations and some not so successful. 
However, in that particular time period, there are a number of other individuals that were involved at, at um, Western. And this is one of the ones that I particularly um, uh, is interesting. And this was Dr. Vanuela, and he uh, was a neuroradiology resident. He uh, was from Uruguay, um, and uh, he actually did time on the neurosurgical service when I was there. Um, and uh, so he was a neuroradiologist who spent a fair amount of time uh, on the neurosurgical service. He was trained by Dr. Alcock, and he uh, was involved in developing aneurysm calling which was a new way of dealing with aneurysms at that time. So this is a aneurysm coiling. So we had tried to block this, this blood vessel here. And then with aneurysm coiling, what occurred was we blocked the vessel from the outside with the tourniquet. But then Dr. Venuela and others developed a system where you can then put a coil within the aneurysm. And over a period of time, the aneurysm would thrombose. And when the aneurysm would thrombose, then that would be able to uh, deal with the aneurysm in a different way, not by clip, but by thrombosis and T, taking the pressure off the uh, off the system. Uh, this is the way that almost all of these aneurysms are dealt with now, especially in the posterior fossa and the base of every. And it's very, very rare that um, these are operated on except in third world countries and countries where they don't have the ability to do this particular uh, type of procedure from one aspect. So this was the, uh, the uh, article that I wrote related to uh, uh, the development of Drake uh, Clip and I sent that article around. Uh, the second thing I was involved with was uh, developing uh, 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 the Charles Drake Memorial. Um, you can see it here. So basically, this this one of the um, one of the uh, uh, Drake, uh, Drake students, uh, Ivar Mendez, who's at the University of Saskatchewan now, was a sculpture, and he did the sculpture of Dr. Drake. If you look here, uh, you can see that this actually is in uh, the Drake clip. This is a this is an aneurysm, phaser aneurysm here, and the Drake clip is clipping the uh, aneurysm. And this was basically uh, about 150 or so uh, neurosurgeons that were trained trained by Dr. Drake, and the whole issue. Uh, and if you go to uh, the um, University Hospital in London, Ontario, you'll know, see this um, memorial outside. Um, And this memorial was, was um, Dr. Drake died very soon after um, um, that, the discussions that I, that I had with him. And um, so this is his wife, Dr. Ruth Drake. And Del Reese, which is at that time was a very famous sort of singer, I had had an aneurysm clip by Dr. Drake and she came up uh, when the, um, the memorial was, uh, was dedicated. So um, uh, I'm just gonna go by, uh, the other thing I thought I would mention to you was Dr. Drake was really quite an amazing person. Every year we in the lab, we would have uh, Christmas parties and he would come down to our Christmas parties and, and sort of uh, be, um, be involved in what we were doing in the lab and other things with us related to that. Some of you have heard this before, but I, I thought I would, I would show it again. I, I tell him uh, that work is the spice of life and that it does mean some hardship for their, for their family, but uh, there's no alternative to it if, uh, if you're going to make your mark in surgery. Uh, I tell them, uh, at least to me, and I think to many other senior surgeons that I know, that the, another spice of life is to match your wits with the best in the game. Uh, those minds that are trying to do the same thing you are to beat the disease and disorder that you face, to lick it. That's what it's all about.